Well, I want to do a big, big welcome to all of you who are here on our campus or watching online. And I want to tell you, man, praise God we get to be together. Some of you have probably not heard what happened yet, but in our worship center, we had a fire in our electrical room. And by the way, the fire was just contained in the electrical room, but it's made the worship center a building we can't use right now. And so while the repairs are being made, we are going to have a blast. We're going to have a blast on our campus. We're going to have a blast online. Why? Because we're a church that comes to worship God. We don't need a building. We have Jesus Christ. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. We have all that God's going to do. So I want you to join me right now in getting ready for what God's going to make happen, what God's going to do in a very special way. So again, welcome, welcome. But I could not say more than I want to say to you right now. This is a moment to experience God. So right now, if you're on campus or if you're online and could do this, go ahead and stand and we're going to worship the Lord together. Yeah. 
that gives us strength. My name is Noah and I serve as one of the pastors here at Crossroads and I am so excited that we get to worship together. So if you're on the patio or you're watching online, welcome to Crossroads. Uh, for those of you sitting on the patio, I know that Pastor Chuck, for those of you online, had given us direction to also uh, grab the elements. But if you're here on campus, you should have received a cup that looks like this with the bread and the juice, and uh, we're gonna partake in communion right now. But every time we gather together, communion is a reminder of how much God loved us when he sent Jesus to die on the cross. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we see that the Apostle Paul tells us uh, what that looked like for the early church and the early Christ followers. It's what we do today, but in 1 Corinthians 11, he said, Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, he took bread, having given thanks, and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he did the same thing with the cup. And he said, this cup is my blood in the new covenant. Each time you drink this cup, remember me. Now, this is the one thing that Jesus to, uh, told us to do in remembrance of him every time we gathered. Now, I don't know about you, but I think and I could imagine that he probably had today in mind, 2,000 years ago, because he didn't specify how, would we, how we would be gathering, but that we would be gathering. And I'm wondering if he knew we would be on a patio, uh, gathering together, partaking in communion, or if you're watching online, that he knew that we would be all around the world in front of our screens, worshiping, remembering the sacrifice that he paid when he hung on the cross to forgive us of our sins. Uh, and every time we partake, we're, we're reminded that we are in love with Jesus because of how he saved us. We're reminded of the opportunity to come together as a body of believers to uh, confess our sins and repent from our sins. But it's also an invitation uh, for us to gather together as a body of believers and share in the common union that we have with one another. And it's also a reminder of the hope that we have of the resurrection that Jesus said that at one point he would come back to and, uh, and receive us to himself. So right now, as a body, we're gonna do that together. Uh, we're gonna partake of the bread, like he said, in remembrance of him. And together, let's remember his body that was broken for us. And in the same way, we'll partake in the cup. And 
remember the blood that he shed on the cross on that day. Let's pray. Father, I thank you and I praise you that we're able to gather as a body of believers here on campus or online, anywhere, and just be reminded of the relationship that we have with you. We thank you for dying on the cross to forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Searching for a long, long time A feeling I could never find There's nothing that can satisfy Now I know it could only be you I don't want to build my life On the things that I know will die I know I won't waste my time if it's time I spend it with you.
2009, I was at a very low place in my life. I had gone through a divorce. I was away from my daughter that I just loved so much. Not only that, I just, I lost my job. My church family then just made me an outcast. And, and so I just felt lonely. I did so many things trying to solve my problems. No matter what I did, nothing was working. In 2013, that's when I decided to give church a try again. So I came to Crossroads for the first time with my girlfriend. As soon as I got to campus, I was, I was amazed by the size of this place. But when I got into the church, I just felt, I just felt God just hugged me and, and reminded me that he loved me. And he said, welcome home. I just felt like he began a, a healing process then. So right after that first time I got here to Crossroads, I was able to recommit my life to Christ. And then I felt like he was asking me to trust him. And also he asked me if I could be faithful in every single area of my life. And that was hard. And so I started with grabbing my phone and just giving it to my girlfriend so she can keep me accountable, but also she can just trust me that I was gonna be there for her and just be faithful. And for the next year and two months, I did not, I did not have a phone. Then after that, I decided to uh, join the Spanish ministry as a volunteer to play drums. So there's one day, uh, Pastor Noah and I were having a conversation. I was on stage practicing to play that morning. And so he just, straightforward asked me if I was living with my girlfriend. I had to be honest, so I said yes. And in a very nice and loving way, he asked me why I was living with her if we were not married. Again, I felt like God just reminded me if I was willing to be faithful in every single area of my life. And here I am three days after Pastor Noah was marrying Crystal and I. So as I started being faithful and honest with God. He, he began a restoration in full in my life. I feel like as he continued that healing process in my heart, he also opened doors for me to be able to use my gifts here at Crossroads. Just in the past year, my wife and I were able to join the, the Spanish leadership uh, team. Also, I got to um, be part of the teaching team, which is an honor. I, got, I get to preach sometimes as well. But I got to be at Mexico a couple of weeks ago doing VBS for some kids that they really needed love and hope. I know God has um, restored just so much in my life, more than I expected. And I've been able to see his, his hand and just his faithfulness over my life and my family's life. I'm just so thankful with Crossroads because you can come as you are and find healing, restoration, and a loving family. Wow, Crossroads, it is incredible to be a part of a church that's faithful in its giving. And I know that oftentimes we don't get to see what God does with our faithfulness whenever we give or whenever we're faithful with our tithes and offerings, but there are moments that he gives us glimpses. And I've had the privilege and the uh, opportunity to have a front row seat in Junior's life uh, to see how God's using him and the way that he's being transformed. I'm watching, I've watched his entire family come to faith and they're now a part of our Crossroads family. Uh, they're serving the church and it is incredible to see that. That. And all of, the, all of these moments are made possible because of the church. Uh, we've created environments for people to come and meet the Lord. But every single time we give, God uh, uses it for life change and he uses it to build his kingdom. And every time, Crossroads, that you're faithful and you're giving, that we're faithful together, we get to see 
kingdom work being done. So Crossroads, I want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for being faithful to the Lord when it comes to the area of your finances. Uh, but again, this is only made possible uh, when we gather together and give as a body of believers. So if you want to join us in generosity, there are a couple of ways that you can do that. You can text the word give to the, uh, to the phone number 77247 and you could give electronically. If you're sitting here on the patio and you brought money or you brought, uh, uh, you brought cash or a check, you can give uh, through the offering boxes around, uh, around the patio. You could give that way. But God is honored and glorified every single time that we're faithful in this area of our life. Uh, let us go to God in prayer. Lord, I praise you and thank you for Junior. I thank you, God, that uh, you got a hold of his heart and his entire family. And I thank you, Lord, that we're a part of a church that invests in things like that. I thank you, God, that Crossroads has been faithful through many, many seasons. And I just pray, God, that you would bless this church and continue to bless the body of believers as they give in their tithes and their offerings, as we're able to just give back to what, uh, what's rightfully yours, God. In Jesus' name, amen. What's your mountaintop? Maybe you've reached the top and discovered it's not what you thought it would be. Reaching the peak of anything comes with challenges, especially when you're doing the climb alone. This August, focus on the right mountaintop and learn to enjoy the ascent. Ascent Men's Event, August 20th. Register today at crossroadschurch.family. Uh, good morning, Crossroads. What a joy to be together. And boy, isn't it different today? I'm so excited for what God has for today, but I'm more, even more excited for what God has for uh, August 20th for the men's event for Ascent. Man, and I want to invite every single uh, man who is on the patio right now, maybe watching online, would you join us? Pastor Chuck is going to be there. Lee Strobel is going to be there. We've got a panel that's going to be incredible. You heard Andy talk about it. And we are so excited about what the Lord is going to do through the men in this church, in our community, and the impact that it will have moving forward. And so would you join us August 20th for this men's event? It's going to be super powerful. Well, it's a little different today, wouldn't you say? It, it looks a little different. Uh, everything just looks uh, not like it usually does. And I'm super excited to be able to continue in this series, Live Like You're Dying. And I want to ask this question to you. What is so special about heaven? What is so special about heaven? I want you to think about that question. And I want to share something with you that might change the way that you experience today's message. Now, a little note about today's message. Today's message is going to be the worst message you have ever heard. That's right. You heard me. Today's message will be the worst message that you have ever heard. And it's not because of our different circumstances that we find ourselves in today, not in the worship center, but out here on the patio, but always online, of course. But today's message will surely be the worst message that you've ever heard. Now, if you're maybe tuning in to church or maybe this church, uh, and this is the very first message that you have ever heard in your entire life, there's no question that today will not only be the worst message that you've heard, it might actually be the best message you've ever heard, and it'll probably be even the most mediocre message that you've heard today. But if you've heard a sermon today, or if you've heard a sermon before, and you've evaluated that, you're recognizing that me telling you that this message is going to be the worst message that you've ever heard you're not going to let me inform that decision for you. Why? Because you've experienced other messages. You might be thinking, boy, I have heard way worse messages before. Like, hey, Pastor Craig, remember that message you preached a couple months ago? That one. No, I mean, maybe it was. But the reality is because you've had an experience with other sermons and other messages before, you have this ability to compare something. And today we're talking about heaven. Now, I could sit here and tell you all day long how amazing heaven is. You could maybe sit there and tell me how amazing heaven is. But the reality is 
None of us has actually ever experienced heaven before. None of us have. We can read scripture. We can understand different kinds of examples. In fact, I got a fun one that I can't wait to show you in just a little bit. But none of us could actually begin to describe how amazing heaven truly is because none of us have actually been there. And I think because of that, we often shy away from wanting to talk openly about heaven. Think about this. When is the last time that you have actually talked about heaven? And not just like, boy, I can't wait to get there because life is brutal and the world that we live in is so tough. Or maybe you said, oh, for heaven's sake. Maybe you said something. You might have mentioned the word heaven, but when was the last time that you really talked about it with somebody? I believe this. Our lack of understanding when it comes to heaven often inhibits our excitement for it. What can you tell me about heaven? I bet your list would maybe be like this. Well, God lives there, and Jesus hangs out there too, and I'm pretty sure there's angels, and I'm fairly certain I'm going there, I think. I think the streets are made of gold and not of cheese, like American Tale said in its movie. That's a joke for all the millennials out there. And we're probably just going to worship all day long, I guess, and I don't know, maybe, maybe I'll get bored. Maybe. And all of a sudden, we begin to think about some of these things that, I'm going to speak to the Christians for just a second, we might say, am I allowed to even suggest that I might get bored there? That we, we're just going to do the same thing on repeat all day long? Somebody once said this, asked Christians over and over these two questions, do you want to go to heaven? To which Christians responds with, respond with, yes, but do you want to go today? Most people would say, no. And what does that tell us about our understanding of heaven? Because I truly believe that if we understood heaven even just a little bit more in its depth, and the reality of the kind of place that it will be and what will be there and even what won't be there, we would begin to grow in our excitement. A famous science fiction writer by the name of Isaac Asimov once said this, I don't believe in an afterlife, so I don't have to spend my whole life fearing hell or fearing heaven. Even more for whatever the tortures of hell may be, I think bored, the boredom of heaven would actually be worse. Think about that. That he would rather endure the tortures of hell than be bored in heaven. You see, as a people, I believe that we are uninformed. But I also believe that there's hope. And I want to encourage you to stick with us the next three weeks because we're going to fast forward and be able to dive into some crucial information. Next week, Pastor Chuck is going to be talking about the five most commonly asked questions about heaven. I can't wait for you guys to hear these questions and to hear Pastor Chuck go to scripture and us be able to answer some of these questions with definitive answers. And of course, two weeks from today, we get to hear from Lee Strobel. He recently wrote a book called The Case for Heaven and it is a powerful, powerful book, and he has done incredible, incredible we, uh, research. So not only will it be today, next week, and the week after that, but I want to encourage you that you will be able to walk out of here at the end of this series, Live Like You're Dying, and you will actually be equipped to handle conversations with somebody about what heaven will be like and even talk about what it won't be like. You see, you may believe that there is a literal heaven and hell and that they are real places, which they are, and that they are eternal landing places for our souls, which they are, but you may not be properly equipped to talk about heaven because you aren't 100% sure what the experience will be like. In fact, some of the writers in the Bible, including Paul, didn't even have words for this. Look at 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verses 2-4. through 4. He talks about this. He says, I was caught up in the third heaven 14 years ago, whether I was in my body or out out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside of my body, but I do know that I was caught up to paradise and heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words, things no human is allowed to even tell. I get it. 
Sometimes words don't do justice for certain experiences. I could sit here and tell you how beautiful Hawaii is, but until you go and experience it, you'll never be able to understand that for your own. And so when Paul writes this, along with other writers, we see David talk about this. We'll look at Revelation here in a little bit. We'll understand that the things that are being talked about, man, there are just no words that could do it justice. But I want to call back to something in that verse, because I know you might be thinking like, whoa, whoa, whoa. There's something in that verse I'm hung up on. we got to go back to it. Well, let's go. You see, Paul actually says something in there where he says, a third heaven. What does that mean? Well, what's interesting is Paul's readers in a Jewish world would have understood this completely when he talks about a third heaven, that he was caught up in this third heaven. Heaven. When scripture talks about three heavens, everybody reading this at that time would have understood exactly what he was talking about. The understanding goes like this, is that the first heaven is the air that we breathe, the environments that we live in, the surroundings in our lives here on earth, physical places, the air that we breathe, that would be the first heaven. The second heaven would actually be the universe, outer space, the cosmos, And then the third heaven would actually be the heaven that you and I know. It would be this. It would be God's eternal dwelling place. A place where our souls could end up being uh, being at one day based on what kinds of decisions you make about who God is and what he did through his son Jesus. But don't confuse, caveat, don't confuse heaven with different kinds of levels of heaven as other religions might actually promote. The first and second heavens, the surroundings, the air, the universe, the planets, all of those will pass away. All of those will pass away. God will be making all things new, a new heaven and a new earth. And so please understand that, that when we talk about this third heaven, this is God's dwelling place where we will be with him one day. The word heaven actually shows up 276 times in the New Testament alone. And we actually know some specs about heaven. We actually know a couple of things. Look at Revelation chapter 21, verses 15 through 17. It says this, The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, and his length is as great as the width. And he measured the city with the rod 15. 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. And he measured its wall, 72 yards thick, according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, and 1,500 miles high. We're talking about the new Jerusalem. We're talking about the new city that when God said there will be a new heaven and a new earth, there will be a new city that we will one day dwell on in his new heavens, new earth. Now, to help understand a little bit about what this would look like, um, I want to show you something uh, that's kind of cool. I want you to look at this for a second. This is a globe right here, right? You guys familiar with this? Right? You ever do like a fun game where you like spin it and then you just like pick a spot and you got to like name the country? Uh, okay, maybe I'm just a history nerd or whatever. So anyways, this is what this would look like if you were to, uh, t- to ratio this out right here, just like that. This would be what would considerably be a 1,500 mile, certainly not to scale, uh, a 1,500 mile wide, 1,500 mile uh, length, and then 1,500 miles high. This is currently sitting on top of a part of the United States of America on this globe right here. And this is how big this would look. To give you a little bit of context, The 1,500 miles high, if you were just to incorporate that in the height of a building, take a standard office building where a story would be about 12 feet in between, right? You got like a 10-story building, 12 feet, you uh, you got about 120 feet right there, right? That's about how that would go. This is how tall this is going to be. You ready for this? At 12 feet per floor, per story, 1,500 miles high, you're looking at a building that would be 600,000 stories high. That's what we're looking at when we're talking about the glory and majesty of heaven. You can't comprehend that. 
It is so tall that if you stood a mile away from this, from this build, from this city, from this building right here, you would not be able to see the top of it. You wouldn't be able to distinguish it. In fact, even from 10 miles away, you may not be able to even see the very top of it. That's how incredibly high and tall this is. This, we're getting into things now that we can't even wrap our minds around. The cubic feet, because this would be a cube, the cubic feet of this would be 3,375,000,000 cubic feet. You hear this question a lot. Well, won't heaven get like crowded? Are you kidding me? 12 story, 12 foot stories, 600,000 stories. We got plenty of rooms. In fact, Jesus said that he's going to prepare a place for us. And so I love that this idea is what we could look at and what we could expect about what John actually saw in Revelation when he described that. So that's a little bit of an understanding, a little bit of a prop right there. I love that. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, it says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then verse 4, it says, To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. There's a word in there that I bet you've heard in Scripture if you've been around uh, church uh, for any length of time. And it's this word inheritance. It's this word inheritance. Our inheritance is, in short, it's heaven. That's our inheritance. That's what we get to step into. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15, it says this. That is why he, Jesus, is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and people so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance God has promised them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of the sins they had committed under that first covenant. He's talking about that Jesus will enable us to experience this inheritance that God has promised for us. You see, we, you and I, we become heirs stepping into an inheritance, an eternity with God if we believe what Jesus did on the cross and subsequently uh, dying on that cross, raising from the dead, dying and paying the price for all of mankind's sin, a debt that nobody could pay. And what's the result? What's the result of all of that? Well, Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17 says this, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we uh, are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs of, uh, of co-heirs with Christ if we indeed share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in the glory. If you were to jump over to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, it would actually say that Jesus was appointed by God as the heir of all things. And then if you look at that Romans verse, it says that we are co-heirs with Christ, which simply means this. In sharing in his sufferings, we will also share in his inheritance. What belongs to Jesus will one day belong to us as children of God, namely, eternity with God Almighty. Now, the thing that I love about this First Peter passage, I know I've co covered a couple of them. The thing I love about this passage is it doesn't actually describe what heaven will be like. It actually says what heaven will not be like. It, will, it actually shows what will be absent from heaven, which I think as human beings with finite minds, what heaven will not include is so much of what we see happening on this earth today. Go back to 1 Peter, uh, verses 3 through 4, uh, uh, verse 4 right here. It says this, an inheritance that is, you ready for it? We talked about inheritance. Here's the inheritance. It's heaven. And what will this look like? It will be imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So what's so special about heaven? What is so incredibly special about heaven? What are the things that we can talk about? Well, I want to point three things out to you today that we pull out right from this passage from 1 Peter. The first one is this. Number one, heaven is imperishable. It is imperishable. 
This Greek word for the word imperishable is aphthartos, which means uncorrupted, not liable to corruption or decay. To perish, you know this, means to decay or to pass away. To decay uh, is to is to uh, uh, gradually be able to erode, that it is, it is slowly, slowly dying. And yet heaven and everything in it will be imperishable. Now, I don't have to convince you that we live in a pretty corrupt world. I don't have to convince anybody of that here today. Imagine in an existence where everybody, this is going to be what, you're not going to be able to wrap your mind around what I'm about to say. Imagine an existence where everybody believed the best in everybody else, hoped the best in everybody else, and understood the best in everybody else. You and I can't, we can't imagine that. There will be no ill will. There will be no suffering. There will be no hatred in heaven. Heaven is imperishable. There will be complete trust there. The thing I love about Peter writing about this is Peter's purpose here is not to add to the list of joys, but to assure, assure us that the joys that we will experience in heaven, that they will never decay. That those things will never die. What's a joy in your life? What's a joy in your life? When I got into youth ministry, one of the things that was such a reprieve for me at the end of every single night being totally exhausted was that I would come home and you know what I would dive into? Not a shower, not my bed. I'd go to the pantry and I'd pull out a box of cereal and I would go ham on several bowls. Not one, sometimes not two, some. I usually cut it off at three if I'm being honest with you. I can maybe do four. But nothing would fuel me. Nothing brought joy in that moment quite like cereal did. So I'd go to the cabinet and I'd open it up. And if you're like me, your favorite cereal is Cocoa Pebbles. That's the best of all the chocolate cereals, by the way. Cocoa Puffs will destroy the roof of your mouth. Cocoa Krispies, not quite enough chocolate in there. But if you get Cocoa Pebbles, it's a two-for-one deal, right? It's a bargain. And the bargain is you eat the cereal and then you get the chocolate milk after and it's amazing. And so I'd pour a huge bowl. I could go through a box in about a night, no problem. And then I'd go over to the fridge and I'd open it up and I'd pull out the milk and I would look at it and my heart would sink because I would see the date on the side of the milk carton. And I was like, oh no, this expired. And I'd be like, that's oh, probably okay. And then I would twist off the top and I'd take a whiff. Whew, can't do it. I can't tell you the number of times that I ran out to the grocery store at 11.30 at night just for that milk. Could you imagine being in heaven and not have to leave the room that Jesus has prepared for you to go to the store and get milk? You see, nothing will perish in heaven. Nothing will decay. And everything in it will last forever. Jesus actually points to this and offers a challenge to you and I. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20 says this, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. What's Jesus' challenge here? It's this. He's asking this question. Are you living with eternity in mind? Are you investing in the things on this earth that will matter for eternity? Namely virtues such as wisdom and patience and understanding and being gracious with people and being willing to extend forgiveness to people. Because it's these kinds of things that we will live immersed in in heaven. These are the kinds of things. Or are we investing in all the wrong kinds of things? And there's a couple of different ways that we could assess that. We could look at the time that we spend in certain things. One of my favorite things is one of my buddies, we, uh, we, we, send, uh, we send screenshots of our screen time weekly to each other. And it's a little bit of a competition. And the whole idea is this, am I investing my time into what matters? And some weeks I'm looking at my screen time and I'm like, I spent that much time on social media. I spent that much time watching Netflix and then I got to scroll, and sometimes I find my Bible app on there, and I'm like, wow, it's embarrassing, because sometimes I recognize that the things that I'm invested into in this earth, these things aren't going to matter. Your bank account is another incredible example of, are you willing to invest in eternity? Are you willing to understand that the things that we invest in here on earth, it matters? That's why God talks so much. We see the scripture covered talking about money. 
Because Jesus cares about that. Jesus cares about the condition of your heart, recognizing that everything on this earth will pass away. There will be things in heaven that will not pass away. Are you invested in the right thing? Are you living with eternity in mind? You see, there's a real bargain that's incorporated in this whole idea of heaven being imperishable, and it's this. Our perishable lives, fully surrendered to Jesus on earth, will result in an imperishable eternity with Jesus in heaven. Folks, that's a bargain. That is a bargain right there, that if we're willing to commit a perishable life to God and recognize our need for him, our souls get to, an experience, get to experience an imperishable eternity. Heaven is imperishable. Number two, the second thing Peter talks about is that heaven is undefiled. Heaven is undefiled. To defile something is to ruin something or to make it dirty. Several years ago during one of our Christmas shows, uh, as if you've been uh, around uh, one or maybe you want to go and you want to check out one online and go see what those are like, we have aerialists. We've had aerialists in the past. And so they have these massive silks that get thrown from the catwalk into the worship center. And what happens is, is these aerialists, they will climb up these uh, silks and they will do all these incredible routines that I know if you're like me, you're like, wow, how do they do that? And maybe if you're kind of prideful like me sometimes I'm like I could do that and so all of a sudden you're watching some of this happen and at one of the shows one of our incredibly gifted worship pastors who was an intern at the time pastor John Allen y'all know John we all love John right he's up in the catwalk and he decided you know what it's snack time I'm kind of hungry so what he had up there was he had a big old plate of french fries and if you know John he can't just eat the french fries by themselves. He's got to have something to dip them in. So he had a big old plate of ketchup. And so all of a sudden, the aerialists are done. And so they're done. And so everybody up in that catwalk, they're pulling up the silks. And all of a sudden, John is pulling up this silk. And he's pulling it up. And he's pulling it up. And as he's pulling it up, he doesn't realize that the silk is landing in the plate of ketchup on the catwalk with him. And so he turns around and he freaks out and he's got water up there and he's literally pouring water on this, trying to get this thing out because in just a few moments, that silk is going to have to be dropped back down from the catwalk and it's going to look like it was a murder scene, like there's blood all over. What happened? Nobody wants that kind of experience in a Christmas show. You see, that silk was defiled. That silk had undergone a transformation that not even a little bit of water or maybe even club soda in that moment could undo. But the whole point is this. Heaven and everything in it, including you and I, will be undefiled. You see, the problem is, is sin actually defiles you and I. And it ruined and continues to ruin God's perfect plan for creation which is why there was a need for a savior. You see, this world has been ruined because of you and I and because of our sin. But what's beautiful is this, not so in heaven. In Revelation chapter 21, uh, verse 27, in the message translation, it says this, nothing dirty or defiled will get into the city. I talked about that, right? 1500, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about heaven. And no one who defiles or deceives, none of that will be permissible, will be permitted into heaven. Only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will get in. Heaven is imperishable and heaven is undefiled. And then number three, it's this, heaven is unfading. Heaven is unfading. This word right here, unfading, comes from a Greek term that would be used about, uh, to speak about the beauty of flowers. That's what it would look like. Flowers are beautiful, right? Just a couple days ago, this past Tuesday, my wife and I celebrated 13 years of marriage. That's right, I'll let the applause settle amongst you guys. 13 years of marriage, which is applause to her putting up with me for that long. And so one of the things that I got her was I got her flowers. And it doesn't matter how much time and energy and effort I put into caring for those flowers. Because when I got home, I'm no florist, but I've watched YouTube videos. I took the stems and I cut them at a little bit of an angle. And I took the little uh, amount of like, a, 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 what is that, the flower food or whatever that gets wrapped around the stems of that. And I pull it out and I get the vase and I pour it in there and I get the water and I put the flowers in. And then I heard that you have to change the water every single day to preserve the flowers. And I can... Stand before you as God is my witness that the flowers that I bought her on Tuesday do not look like what they, uh, the flowers looking like uh, today do not look like what they look like on Tuesday. The flowers sitting in that vase, they've wilted. 
They have undergone a transformation, but not for the better. They are beginning to fade. You see, even the most stunning and beautiful creations on this earth won't last. And they have flaws if you actually look closely at them because we live in an imperfect and fading world because all of this will pass away. But again, not so with heaven. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 5, it says, And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. Have you ever thought about different seasons of your life? Have you ever thought about a a job that you had one time or a friendship that you had one time or a vacation that you had one time and you think about some of the best moments or best seasons of your life? Maybe a great season of friendship. For my wife and I, when it comes to our kids, we are, my wife loves our kids, and I love our kids. But if my wife could live in an unending, perpetual, unfading season with kids, you know what season it would be? Babies. She loves the babies. That would not be my choice of a best season with children in my life. I'm loving the season we're in right now. They're 10 and 7. I'm loving getting to do things with them. It is so incredibly Fun, But imagine that favorite season unending. Imagine that season never actually fading away. Constant enjoyment. Every uh, favorite season of every aspect of your life on repeat in heaven. Imagine that. Heaven is unfading. Which kind of begs this question. I mean, the vacation was fun. I mean, raising the kids in that season was fun. That job was fun. Those friendships were fun. The things I got to, it was fun. But I'm going to be honest with you, won't I get a little bored? Won't there be moments where I'm like, I, I can't, I can't, I, I don't know if I could keep doing this. You see, I want to call back to something because something really important to remember is that our minds, the way that God has created them, are completely finite, We can't even begin to imagine what an infinite God and an omniscient, all-knowing God is actually like and what it would be like to live in eternity with that. You see, as things begin to fade, we often become disinterested. I'll never forget flying to China on a missions trip uh, back when I was in college uh, in the mid-2000s. And um, and as we were flying over there, uh, it was the middle of the night. I have no idea what time it was. I probably should have been sleeping. And I happened to open up the, uh, I, the, 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 the window covering, and I raise it up. And off in the distance are these thunder clouds, these storm clouds. And you guys, if you've ever seen lightning from a plane off in the distance, again, it's the experience. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Because if you haven't, this isn't going to hit you the way it would hit some of you that have seen it like I have. The constant glow of those clouds with the lightning hitting, literally the clouds did not go dark. They were constantly illuminated because of the lightning strikes and the claps of thunder that were no doubt happening in those moments. In Revelation chapter four, it actually talks about heaven being unending uh, claps of thunder and flashes of lightning. If you're like me, being around a thunderstorm is so cool. This is what happens when you are born and raised in Southern California. You get to be a part of a a thunderstorm. You're like, dude, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. But there's something about it that is this adrenaline rush. Before I got into ministry and a couple other things that God sent our, uh, me and my family on a wild journey. I was a, I, out of college. I was a public accountant. And I worked for a company, and one of our clients was in the Simi Valley. And uh, I'll never forget being out of town for that week. They put us up in a hotel, and uh, we, were, uh, we were doing, um, you know, auditing a particular uh, uh, organization out there. And I get into the hotel room one night, and it was a little later, and I'm getting ready to fall asleep. Have you ever been in that state where, like, you're a little delirious and you're not 100% sure what's going on and you're about to fall into sleep and then all of a sudden my bed starts to shake? And I was, I was, I was, I wasn't really coherent in that moment because I was on the verge of falling asleep and I was imagining somebody had broken into my hotel room and was getting ready to attack me and somehow shook my bed. And I will never forget pulling those covers back and just coming to and being like, I'm ready to fight whoever whoever is in here. And then I realized, oh, we're having an earthquake right now. 
And I'd been around earthquakes long enough to know this wasn't a big earthquake. But the fact remained that my adrenaline was pumping. And this is the kind of adrenaline that I believe that our bodies will experience because we will get new bodies in heaven. That all of a sudden we'll begin to realize, man, this energy that I experience nonstop, there's no chance that we will ever get bored. There's no chance that we will ever get bored. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses three, uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 11, it says this, Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. I love that line. God has planted eternity in the human heart. You see, even in God's vast, all-encompassing work from beginning to end, he knows, he knows you, and he longs for a relationship with you. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, it says this, Look, I stand at the door and knock, and if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in, and we will share a meal together as friends. I bet you've heard that verse before. I bet you've heard that verse before. That Jesus stands at the door of your heart and he is knocking. And he wants to know if you'll answer him. Because there is a bargain that is awaiting you that he says, I want you to take me up on this because I long for a relationship with you so deeply and so intentionally. If you go three verses later, In Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, something miraculous happens. Remember, Jesus was standing at the door and knocking. And then look at what happens. Look at what John writes. He says this in Revelation 4, verse 1. Three verses later, he says, Then I looked, and I saw a door standing open in heaven. And the same voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. What are you going to do with the knocking at your heart? What are you going to do when God is knocking on the door of your heart? Are you going to answer? Are you going to open up that door? Because if you do, you'll be in eternity with God forever. And oftentimes we think that our eternity begins when we die. No, our eternity begins the moment that we say yes to Jesus. That Jesus is going there to prepare a place for you and I. And it's unfathomable. And so I want to invite anybody here out on the patio, watching online, wherever you may be tuning in, I want to invite you that if you've never said yes to Jesus, if you've never opened the door of your heart, and maybe you felt that knocking before, maybe you have felt that pull, that nudge, and maybe that voice has been one that you've maybe ignored or maybe that you've sort of pushed away. But I want to let you know, just like John said, it was the same voice I had heard before, and it'll speak like a trumpet blast. God is for you. God loves you. And if you want to say yes to him, in just a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer. And I invite you to pray this prayer with me. It's a prayer that says, God, you're God, and I'm not. And I'm in need of a Savior. And if you want to say yes to him, if you feel that knocking, I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer right where you're at. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for every single person tuning in right now. God, not by accident. You're listening to this. You're a part of this experience for a reason. And for anybody in here who wants to say yes to Jesus, maybe you've ignored him for a long time. Maybe you've, maybe you've willingly or actively just said no to him time and time again. I'm going to give you a chance to say yes to him right now. I'm going to pray a prayer, and I invite you right where you're at, Would you pray this prayer silently to yourself, right where you are? I want this moment to be between you and the Lord. Pray this. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for dying on the cross 
from my sins. I need you. I love you. And I thank you. Thank you for never giving up on me. Today I say yes to you. Yes, I want your love. Yes, I want the life you have for me. And yes, I want you to make me yours. So fill me with your love and fill me with your Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen for every single one of you that prayed that prayer. Way to go. We could not be more proud of you for praying that prayer. In fact, we think it's such a big deal around here that we actually invite you to tell us that you've made that decision. And so if you are watching online or you are on the patio right now, would you pull out your cell phone? I want you to pull out that cell phone right now, and I want you to text the word AMEN to 77247. Do it right now. Pull out that phone. In that phone number line, 77247, and then just text the word AMEN. And I want to let you know that one of our pastors will reach out to you. We want to celebrate with you. We want to give you some resources. We want to help you figure out what's next in this journey, but we couldn't be more excited. And what you're experiencing right now is a door has been opened and your eternity is sealed because you've made this commitment here today. And praise God for every single one of you that made that decision. Praise God. Praise God. Well, Crossroads, it has been such a joy to be together on a day that looks very different, but we know that we serve and love the same God. I want to invite you uh, to uh, prayer in the chapel. We're going to have some leaders available right after this service, and they are available right out here on the patio. And you can always text prayer to 77247, and we'd love to pray for you. And we want to invite you back to a message by Pastor Chuck coming up this Wednesday. And folks, it's going to be one of the most powerful messages that you have ever heard, and I'm not kidding you on that. It's going to be extremely, extremely powerful as we continue in our series. You believe that this coming Wednesday. Well, Crossroads, as you go today, may you walk in the joy and the peace of the Lord. And amen and amen. Have a great day. Thanks for joining us online today. If you made a decision to follow Jesus today, we hope you'll text the word amen to 77247 so that we can provide you with the resources to help you on this journey. Our online team would love to hear your story and help you take your next step. So if you'd like to have a virtual coffee with our online team, just text us to 77247 and say coffee chat and we'll follow up with you. And if you would like to be baptized, we would love to get that scheduled for you on our campus or wherever you're watching from. So you can text baptism to 77247 and we'll get that going for you. If this message resonated with you, or if you just need prayer for something, would you let us know in the comments? Our team reads every comment that comes through, and we love interacting with you. If this message added value to your life, make sure you hit the subscribe button and turn on the notifications so that you'll never miss a new message from us. And consider sharing the, this link with someone because, you know, sharing is caring, and they might need to hear this message. We're live on Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. right here online and Sundays at 9 a.m. and on demand anytime after that. So thank you, Crossroads, for watching. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time.